Hey guys, uh, continuing my uh, tradition of having unbelievable guests on my show. I don't know how I convinced these guys to come on my show today. I've got the phenomenal, unbelievably charming Vikas Shah, who's coming on my show. I'll be, I'll be talking about his intro in a second. But first, how are you doing, Vikas? I'm, I'm good. And can I just say, it's a real honor to be, be on this side of an interview with you. And, and thank you so much for, coming, for having me on. Oh, you are so lovely. All right. Uh, so let me just introduce you very quickly. I have these uh, prepared notes. So you're an entrepreneur, and we'll be talking about entrepreneurship and lessons that we can glean from you know, entrepreneurship. You're an investor. You're a philanthropist. In a second, we'll talk about a great act of philanthropy that you just engaged in uh, you know, a few days ago. You're the host of the hugely popular Thought Economics platform, wherein you've hosted, I mean, I went through the list. I don't know how you do it. I mean, now, I could say I have a small claim to fame. I am one of only two people that have been twice on correct. that platform. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. And the, and the result of that uh, platform, uh, and I'll mention in a second some of the guests. Well, let me mention them now. Sir Richard Branson. Mark Cuban, Brian Grazer, I won't go through the whole list, Kevin O'Leary, Shaq O'Neal, Usain Bolt, Olivia Newton-John from my childhood, some thinkers, unbelievable, uh, Noam Chomsky, Neil Ferguson, Steven Pinker, Richard Dawkins, Jane Goodall, Jordan Peterson, a couple of Nobel laureates, yours truly twice, some incredible world leaders, some of whom have had Nobel Peace Prizes, it's all in this book. This is the original yeah. hardcover. Show us the paperback. And, uh, and the paperback is now out internationally. Um, so so this, is, this has come out. This is a slightly more updated version. And um, this came out this week in the US, UK and, and most English speaking markets and translations are to follow. Oh, I'm sure it's going to be a smash hit. Uh, let me just Thank wrap you. up the, the bio. You've taught entrepreneurship at the University of Manchester, University of Lancaster, and you were a visiting professor at the MIT Sloan uh, Lis uh, Lisbon branch. Yeah. You received an MBE from Her Majesty the Queen in 2018. For those of you who don't know, I think the order works. First MBE, then OBE, then yeah. when it's CBE, we will be forced to call you Sir Vikas. Is that correct? Give it time. <laughs> Give it time. <laughs> All right. So let's start with the... Uh, oh, so let me start with the... Uh, the act of incredible philanthropy. Maybe you can uh, tell us what that's all about. You donated your entire archive of conversations to Salford University. Yeah. Tell us about that. So, so I started Thought Economics in 2007 um, because I, I, I love long form content. And that was the time when digital media was creating you know, sound bites and headline culture and short form. And so I thought there must be other people like me who wanna have these conversations. So I started reaching out to people that I, I, I'd met at conferences with my businesses and and then started to get cheeky and think, who else can I get to? And so that, that started in 2007 and it's been an incredible journey. And over the past couple of years, I've, I've had a few different people approach me to kind of buy the archive and maybe put it behind a paywall and, you know, on, on major newspapers. And I just thought, I don't want to do that because, you know, people talk about society as if it's this thing like the weather but it's not you know civilization is us it's the process it's it's the output of ideas and whatever ideas become culturally accepted as the ideologies of the time and you know i've interviewed 500 plus of some of the world's most interesting and important thing because you've shaped the way culture is and so instead of selling the archive i wanted the archive to have a bigger impact and the University of Salford has a journalism school. Um, it has all these other students there who will become the next generation of top international journalists and writers and broadcasters. And so I said, well, maybe they ought to hear these ideas and maybe they ought to have this archive. So I gave them that archive um, last week. And um, yeah, so I was really pleased with that. That's amazing. How did you, I mean, uh, you, you alluded to the fact that, you know, you're, you're interested in long form chats, but in a sense, you truly are one of the pioneers of the long, I mean, I only started in, I think, 2014. Mm -hmm. So that's about eight years ago. You know, Joe Rogan, of course, is probably he's the, the most. OG. He's the OG, right? But we I should mean, always salute when we say Joe Rogan. <laughs> by the way. Joe that, Rogan. That has to be a thing now. Uh, that is true. Uh, and, but so how, I mean, how, Yes, you had met some of these people at conferences and so on, but your ability to connect with these, you know, people of incredible excellence across so many different domains itself is probably a story. How how were you able to reach many of these people that probably have many sort of gateways before you can get to them? How, what was your yeah. strategy? So, 
there was three there was three big lessons really and, and the, the first lesson is pure persistence right so you know i'm i'm effectively an independent blogger you know i'm not some big celebrity i'm not you know writing for the new york times or something and so the default position is going to be no and it's my job to persuade them otherwise and i will keep pushing until i get a yes or a no effectively so persistence is the first thing the second thing is i think just being curious because you know, for example, it's easy to approach someone and ask them an obvious question, like speaking to an astronaut and saying, well, what was it like to be in space? And they will have been asked that every interview they do. So one of the things that I always do is try and figure out who is that person? What what are they passionate about? And so in my first email, I'll be like, you know, speaking to your PA's PA and saying, you know, dear PA, PA, I would love to speak to Dr. Saad. I know he's passionate about this. Here's what I want to ask. I'll only need this much time. And really importantly, you can check it before I publish it. Because when I back in the day when I was interesting, when I started my first business, <laughs> I used to do lots of media interviews. And I used to get so annoyed that people used to just publish it. And I'm sat there going, but that's not what I said. Or I didn't right. quite mean that. So it's a slightly different approach. And also, I'm not a journalist, so I haven't got an agenda. I don't care whether I agree with them, or I disagree with them. I just want to publish people's ideas. That's it. Fantastic. Uh, you, you know, it's funny because while I don't remember the the details of how you had approached me, I had specifically noticed that this guy has the right etiquette. And even though I had never heard of you, but of course you, I think you probably mentioned, okay, you know, I've, I've spoken to all these people. That already serves as a as a kind of imprimatur that you know other people of yeah. of no. And so this is, I think, a great lesson for people who are watching this, who, you know, everybody wants to start their podcast and their yeah. long form. And one of the things that people do is exactly all of the things that you didn't do. In other words, they do the opposite of what you did, which is, uh, hey, bro, uh, how you doing? I have a chat and I'd like to talk to you. And I'm like, you know what? You've just violated a whole bunch exactly. of etiquette, right? First of all, don't address me this way. Not not because I'm elitist or whatever, but I don't know you. You don't it's right? manners. It's, it's manners. Basic politeness. Right? Tell me who you are. Tell me how what what your show is. Explain to me. So if you're taking three seconds to address me in the most obnoxious of ways, how easy is it going to be for me to say no? So so learn from Vigas Shaw and you will hopefully reach all these incredible people. There's, there's also if I may, Dr. Sad, there's also there's also Please, this please feel free to call me God. Okay, I, I will. Thank you. I will. Well, well, I, th I feel we have enough familiarity now, so I'm going to I'm going to break this now. This is big news for me. Please, please do. Thank you so much. You're very kind. God. Yes, sir. Right. Um, <laughs> By the way, I still can't. I can't. Some of my professors, whom I currently outrank, I still call them Doctor So and So or Professor, even though they repeatedly tell me just call me by my first name. I know. So I get that whole thing, I, and I it's appreciate. It's very strange, but one of the things I always remember is kind of early, some early advice I got in my career, which is no one owes you anything. And actually anyone that gives you their time, it is a huge privilege to have someone's time because it's their most important resource and they're never getting it back. So weirdly, when I'm approaching people for interview, I kind of go in with this principle that, for example, like, you know, you've been kind enough to give me your time twice for interviews on thought economics, but that's your singular most precious resource. And so I have to respect that more than anything else. And so etiquette, manners, you don't owe me anything. You, you've got to go in with that exact approach to try and, you know, build that human connection. And, and too many people don't do that now, sadly. And it is really important. Do, do you think that your, your code of conduct and your etiquette, how much of it is due to simply, it's just the random combinations of genes that made Vikas, that make him a polite, lovely, charming, gracious guy versus those things were inculcated to you via your parents, via your culture and so on. I, I think a lot of my approach to life came from early experiences. So, you know, figuring out what is a value in life early on and removing ego. So, it might be something that we, we talk about later on, but you know, I, I had you know a, quite a, a bad experience in early life with anxiety and depression and all these sort of things. And you know, when when you when you get broken, you have the opportunity to rebuild yourself. But when you get broken, you also understand where your values might be misaligned and where your ego might be misaligned. And so then, when you put yourself back together, I think you end up a better human being as a result. And 
part of that was ego dissolution, i.e., I'm not that important. You know, I am just another big blob of water wandering this earth. And, you know, we're only here for a frighteningly short time. And it's about building genuine human connection. No, not everyone's going to like you. Not everyone's going to hate you. It's just, it just is what it is. So there's a degree of almost stoicism about human relationships, which I think creates stronger human relationships. And then the other side is, you know, it doesn't matter whether somebody's, you know, poor, rich, whatever, everyone deserves the same level of respect and humanity because I need to project that out if people are going to give that back to me. You know, it's so funny you say this because in, in uh, my upcoming book, uh, Recipe for the Good Life, so an ideal a bit with the Stoics and so on, I, t I tell a, a few stories where I interacted with folks who were homeless. And I don't, I don't say this to toot my horn, oh, I'm such a sweet guy, but many of my most profoundly intimate and rewarding relationships came from just being open to a specific moment where I could interact with someone, right? And it's not someone who's fancy from Stanford University. It's it's just someone who approached me at a cafe yeah. or I was taking a bus ride and I started talking to the person next to me. So I think it speaks to your earlier point about sort of having an a, a intellectually curious mindset whereby, you know, I often walk with my wife and I, as we're passing 100 people, I say, how many of these 100 people probably have incredible stories that would yeah. be great for me to talk to them about, right? And pro I'm willing to bet that everybody has this an incredible story to tell, right? Yeah, but, but it's difficult, isn't it? Because what we value as a society is an indicator of who we speak to and who we put on the pedestal. And, you know, the, the, you know, the interview format's really popular now, obviously. There's lots of podcasts, and podcasting is a great form, and so is YouTube, et cetera. And you look through the list, and, and you almost see people starting with lots of very interesting people, irrespective of their fame. And then the minute it becomes their job, whew, it's now just kind of famous or rich people. And So true. And it speaks to our value set. You know, the, the, it speaks to the fact that we value those experiences or those characteristics far more than others. And I know an awful lot of extremely wealthy, stupid people and a lot yeah. of extremely poor, hyper intelligent people. So, you know, these things aren't often as correlated as we think. And whatever we signal as a society as having value is what our children will determine as having value. And that's ultimately what our society will become. So so we have to pl teach ourselves and society what is of value and and part of it i think is also about the art of conversation we don't ask each other good questions anymore we don't we don't approach each other with this humble curiosity that 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 we experience you know i, I obviously you know i know you, you know you, you grew up outside the us and then came to the us and came from from a different part of the world and when i was growing up you know we we used to go to to india a lot and my, my parents uh, grew up in, in what was quite a poor part of india and i i always remember this absolutely beautiful humility with which people ask me questions you know we were never the rich foreigners we were never these you know aliens but it was just oh so just tell me about like what, what do you eat at home what do you do yeah. and and the thing that sometimes worries me is all oftentimes curious curiosity now can be seen as an insult if you ask somebody a question yeah, they yeah. feel you know, aggrieved by it. And I'm like, well, no, I'm actually just trying to learn because I, I, I want to know more about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, just asking somebody where they come from is now a form of microaggression, right? So if you don't look stereotypically British and someone says, well, where are you originally from? Oh, well, that's insulting. Well, what's insulting about that? Clearly, you yeah. weren't born, uh, you know, in Britain. I wasn't born in Ca in Canada or the US. Yeah. So what's wrong with asking me where I'm from? How but, is that? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the, the context is really important, isn't it? Because, you know, I could ask you, in a very friendly setting over a cup of tea. Oh, so where are you, where are you from originally? Right. And that's very different to me accosting you in the street and saying, oh, I don't like you because your skin's brown. Now, where are you really from? <laughs> yeah, of course. The, the context is removed. Yeah. And and this is this is the nuance. Like I know, you know, so I grew up in the 1980s in England and there was a lot of racism then. And even then that nuance was real where there was a difference between somebody calling you a name on the street and then having a conversation with you versus people who genuinely were curious because, you know, we were new cultures in the 60s and 70s in the UK. There wasn't many people from India who were widely integrated into society. And to me, I saw it as a sign of, of love and as a sign of, a friendship when people were saying, tell me, what do you eat? What do you do? How does your culture work? I, I, I used to love that when people asked me questions about my culture. 
Right. Uh, speaking of sort of curiosity in terms of mm. being a good conversationalist and so, and so on, uh, I tell the story in uh, in the forthcoming book of how when, when my wife and I would go on vacation, this is before we had kids, uh, within the first three days, I would probably have every secret about every person who's at that resort. And the reason why that would happen is because I actually would engage people. And this wasn't the sad truth. This is us sitting around a, <laughs> around the beach and I yeah. just take an interest in someone. And and I remember that my wife would always come to me and say, what what were you doing with this? What, yes, I'm speaking to an elderly woman and we're both looking towards the, the ocean and we're standing there for three hours chatting. She said, what the hell were you talking to her for three hours? I said, well, she was telling me about how her son was abused by the priest. She's, and, I, and she says to me, you got that from first meeting her? This is the first time you're meeting her? And she sh yeah. Well, I think it comes from an open spirit, right? You look at people in the eye, you ask them questions. And I think that's probably the secret to why you've had such a successful platform with Thought Economics, why I've had a successful platform with the sad truth because ultimately the number one step which many most people don't have is most people want to talk about themselves right so when you mm -hmm. go to a party people want to talk about themselves if you now say hey tell me about yourself what do you do what do you... suddenly people are amazed yeah. by the fact that you actually are taking an interest in them rather than in just spewing stuff yeah. about yourself well, you know I, I look at it this way I, I know me I'm kind of dull I know me right <laughs> I'm used to me right. everybody else is interesting and you know, I, I, and you know, the older we get, the more we sadly have friends that pass on and things happen. And, and you realize that, you know, l the only thing we have in this life is our experiences and what a privilege it is to understand other people's experiences. And oftentimes there is a trust that comes from being a stranger. Right. You know, the amount of times that I've been, you know, on a plane, sat next to somebody for a few hours, and I've, I've probably been told secrets that they haven't told their closest friends because <laughs> I'm a stranger. And so I'm, I can't judge them and it's of no consequence. And the conversations with strangers aspect of life is is so it is remarkably beautiful when you embrace it. So are you. Now that you, I mean, you've, you've, you've handed over, you've donated your archives to uh, University of Salford. Yeah. Uh, does that mean that that chapter is over or are you planning to continue long form yeah. discussions either in that platform or a new platform? So I'm going to crack on and carry on. And, Good. and so what I'm allowing, what I'm done at doing is, you know, as I carry on all those new conversations going to the archive and those students and student journalists can you know, learn, you know, the, how to interview, how to cut articles, how to listen to different perspectives. You know, it's it's also things like how do you listen to a conversation with someone you don't agree with and actually listen to it? And th that came from an experience I had when, when I was a bit younger. So I remember there was once there's a there's a main the main street in the middle of Manchester. And I will have you over for the football one day. But the main street down the middle of the down the middle of the city is called Dean's Gate. And I remember walking down that street once. And someone, you know, shouted a, a, a racist slur at me. Um, I, I shan't repeat it, but they shouted a slur at me. And um, and I don't know what it was that day, but I walked across the road and I said, like, I'm really sorry. Like, I know we're probably never going to be best friends, but can I just ask what I've done? Like, can I, I just would like to know. Anyway, we ended up having this conversation where this gentleman, um, his he was second generation out of work. His family had always worked in textiles mills in the north of Manchester in the regions there. And when immigrant populations came in, they, they took a lot of the jobs because they actually often came with, with more relevant skills. His family were then out of work, facing really hard times. And, you know, he, he blamed people of color, people like people like me. And, and I actually said to him, like, I understand. I really, truly, deeply understand why you would think that. And... I, I actually respect the fact that, you know, you, you've you got the strength to even say that slur in a way, because that takes that takes some balls to do that. Right. right. And I said, but meet me in the middle. Let me tell you a bit about me. I've heard a bit about you. And even if we disagree, we both leave this conversation a bit better. Wow. And and that took, you know, I didn't like what he was saying to me, but I just stayed quiet and listened. And he showed me the same respect. And I don't know where he is now, but I'm sure we both left better people. And 
But that was a really profoundly beautiful moment. And that's happened so many times in life. And, you know, I, I'm involved in, uh, in, in, a, in a global peace building charity. And w one of the most important parts of conflict resolution is dialogue. And not the dialogue at the diplomatic level, but the dialogue at the, at the um, community level, where we get communities who've been, you know, probably killing each other's relatives around the table and allow them to have that process of discussion. So I'll give you one example. There was um, a project that we supported in the north of Uganda on the border with South Sudan. Uganda only came out of civil war maybe a decade ago. And there was um, an elderly woman with a farm. Her children had been killed in the civil war. And there was two young men working on the farm. And I said, so, so who are they? Like, are they people from the community? Like, I, I was interested to know how the economy worked and you know how people were in because we were about to fund new work. And she said, oh, no, they used to be rebels. And I said, so is it possible that those young men on your farm could have been responsible for, you know, atrocities in your family? She said, yes. She said, but the war is over now and everyone deserves a chance at peace. Wow. Unbelievable. And that, and that comes from someone who is now maybe employing someone that could have caused grave harm to one of their relatives. And, you know, you have conversations like that and you realize that, you know, that that really is humanity. That is a deep respect for each other's humanity and about the fact that circumstances don't make people. So let me tell you two stories that speak to everything that you've been saying. Uh, probably my most remarkable guest to speak to the point that we made earlier about, you know, not just speaking to people who are famous and, uh, you know, well known and so on. My most impactful chat has been with a gentleman by the name of David McCallum, who is a gentleman who spent 29 years in prison for a murder that he was eventually exonerated from, right? And, and the reason why that chat was so impactful to speak again to the point of forgiveness that you mentioned about the lady in Africa, uh, I was looking at him in the way that he was handling himself post-release mm -hmm. with such grace and such lack of vengefulness, right? And I looked at him and I said, you know, David, I, I truly, I think you are the, the, the reincarnation of Buddha because you're a much better man than I am. Because if I had, if I had, if 29 years had been stolen of my life, from my life, I don't think that I could have been as forgiving as, as you were. And yet you seem so well adjusted. And so he, he basically told me the following, which I thought was incredible. He said, look, I have a sister who uh, has been bedridden with cerebral palsy all her life. And she smiles and she lives yeah. life to the fullest of her ability. And so anything that I went through compared to what she has to go through on a daily basis is nothing. There is no yeah. point in having the, the venom in my heart. And so let's... And so I thought that probably that singular interaction was with this gentleman was more powerful than all of yeah. my other conversations combined. Uh, do, you want, do you want to interject? Then I'm going to yeah. tell you the second story. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so I remember once, um, so many years ago, I had, I had an office in the States and I was coming out of the building and it was, it was a winter day. And there was, there was a guy who was, you know, obviously um, homeless, sat in the kind of the, the entryway to the building anyway. And I just sort of said, like, are you OK? And he goes, oh, I'm doing I'm doing good, sir. And I said, are you are you really? Because it's very cold. And he said and he actually and this was this was amazing because he said, what, what did you see when you woke up in the morning? And I said, well, I saw the hotel room. And he goes, well, I saw the sunrise. So I think I had a better wow. day. Wow. Unbelievable. And it's exactly to what you said. Like, you know, in my mind, I, I often feel like if I ended up in those circumstances, would I be angry and vengeful? Would I be angry that someone else has now created these circumstances for me and but i feel like when people take responsibility for the fact that there are things out of your control in life but your what you control is how you respond to those situations that's sto that's the stoic position it correct? is but 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 we all need a bit of that because bad stuff happens and we have to respond to it well and with dignity yes beautiful second story so I'm a first year doctoral student at Cornell. Uh, because I'm from Lebanon, I connect with a whole bunch of uh, Arabic students. We were playing soccer together and so on. And one day, one of the uh, Lebanese students, uh, fellow students, uh, asks me out for a coffee. I say, okay, sure, let's, let's go out. And uh, then as we're sitting there, he goes, you know, Gad, I, I really, really like you. I said, I'm not gonna say his name, even though 
I don't think he's watching the show. Uh, I said, well, wh why do you say that as though you're surprised? Is it because I'm Jewish? He goes, well, but God, you're not a Jew, Jew. I said, well, I am actually. I'm a Jew, 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 Jew. He yeah. goes, no, but you know what I mean? You're not. So in his mind, he had a vision of the Jew, the diabolical Jew. He hadn't met any Jewish people because any Arabic speaking Jews had long been exterminated or had been exposed yeah. and so on. And so I didn't fit the mold of the yeah. image of the Jew that he had in his head. Yeah. I was Arabic speaking. I was just as Arabic as he was. I was friendly. I was yeah. warm. So his reaction of, I really like you, had broken down the bear, the archetype that he has created in his head. Or exactly. Head. So, so it's all about dialogue. Yeah. So... A, a sort of more recent example that we saw is so we we were working ag again in a part of sub-Saharan Africa where until recently there's been a lot of landmines and no real medical care, and we'd heard from partner NGOs that there was discrimination against people with disabilities, and I was like kind of curious like okay well maybe we should go have a look at this, and we used a technique called forum theater, which is really fascinating, and it means that people are putting on a theater performance, and at any point the audience can put their hand up and swap out with a character to act wow. out what they think would happen next. This is research-based, by the way. It's not just play. It's a research-based intervention in the arts. And it became really apparent that there wasn't a discrimination. There was a lack of knowledge because until recently, if you stepped on a landmine, because there was no medical care, you would pass away. But since there's now medical care and prosthetics, for the first time in more than a generation, right. they now have people with disabilities in society. But society has lost its institutional memory for what that means. And, 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 and so there wasn't discrimination, but people just didn't know. They didn't know how to interact with people with disabilities because they hadn't had any for such a long exactly. time. And, and that forum theatre approach allowed people to have that dialogue in a safe way. And it was beautiful because it revealed that there was so much un unnecessary grief on both sides that can be resolved by having a conversation. You're, you're basically demystifying that which you don't know, right? Yes. That's exactly yes. it. Wow. T tell us a bit more about that charity because you had sent me some notes about it that how you use art and art therapy, I guess, to try to help people who are coming from conflict uh, regions of yeah. the world. Tell us more about that. So this was this was an accidental endeavor. I, I went to a lecture about 14 years ago, an open lecture from a professor at Manchester, and it just sounded really interesting. And the, the, his opening line in his lecture, which I remember to this day is, why do people make art when there's bombs dropping? And I was there going, that's really true. I don't know. And it turns out he'd spent 10 years going to Bosnia, Serbia, all these places, researching this and finding that art was one of the most profoundly powerful ways for people to express themselves in serious conflict and also to communicate with the other side and to communicate with the other in conflict to show how they're feeling and to communicate with the outside world. So he turned those into, into research-based tools that you could use in arts practice and I, I was working with him we provided some seed funding we helped it grow we turned it into a charity it's now in 32 countries and we'll go into places of conflict it might be war it might be civil conflict it might be gang violence whatever it is and we'll support the community using arts first so music theater whatever it might be and then it allows dialogue to develop and once you build community cohesion, then you can do all the other stuff, economic development, etc. But you have to have that bond between the human humanity first. You know, that that first sentence that you said about the professor, the, the first line in his lecture, it, it resonates very strongly with me because in in my forthcoming book, I have a whole chapter on life as a playground. And yeah. so the importance of viewing so much of how we live life as a form of play, including scientific research as a form of play, right? You're trying to identify patterns between variables that heretofore had not been uncovered. It's a form of puzzle, puzzle solving, right? And in that chapter, I talk about the importance of play even in deeply war-torn places. So it yeah. speaks to your point. And I give the story, I, I tell the story of my uh, childhood in Lebanon uh, during the first year of the Civil War, 
where the need to play was so great that we would have to go outside to play. But my parents would tell me, don't pass this particular line because then that would open you up to the vision of the snipers. So yeah. play within this area, but don't pass. So even in the most ominous, dangerous of situations, our instinct to play, and in this case to appreciate art, yeah. is there. And and it sounds strange, but I think for, for most of, and I love this word, but for most of Occidental Western civilization, we're probably the first generation who has grown up without the experience of war in the sense that most parts of the world experience practically every generation. And so the degree of comfort we feel perhaps in civilization means that our value set changes and our notion of life changes. And you know, wherever we go in the world where there is conflict, you, you see exactly that, which is you see you see the beauty and sim the beauty in the important, simple things in life, like play, like, you know, playing a game of cards under the moonlight because there's no power. Right. Or, you know, uh, two, you know, elderly men who are playing dominoes, but they've only got four dominoes, but they still play. And it's it's part of who we are. And, and we sometimes, I think, dismiss these activities as not being meaningful because we have this cult of productivity where everything we do has to be part of yes. us manifesting our goals and we forget that that's not going to matter in the end so true beautiful uh, i want to come back in a bit to your uh, bout with anxiety and depression but before we get to that i want to kind of contextualize who you are in terms of as an entrepreneur as a business person Tell us a bit about the trajectory that led you to where you are today from a business perspective. So, so if you if you will indulge me for a moment, because there is a reason I need to be slightly uh, psychotherapeutic about this and go, when I was a child, okay. so, so, so I grew up by basically next to an international airport and all I ever wanted to do was be a pilot. That was it. And when I was a kid, I used to, you know, build these little radios so I could listen to the plane, the planes, you know, radio and all this. Um, as it turns out, that's a really expensive career choice. Well, it was then when we didn't have the kind of financial support. And I couldn't join the Air Force because of my glasses. Oh, um, right. But I could, in theory, become a commercial pilot. And so I thought I have to make some money. So I was 13 and I literally picked up a phone book, which for your younger listeners is basically Google, but printed out. <laughs> so I picked up a phone book. And I started ringing businesses in Manchester and saying, look, I'll do some design work for you for 50 pounds. And my plan was every two jobs I did would pay for one flying lesson. Simple, right? By the time that I was 16, this was at the start of the first dot-com bubble, which I didn't realize, by the way. By the time that I was 16, I now had offices in Manchester, London, New York, and Sydney. How? Yeah. How? Explain. It, 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 <laughs> fill in that, those blanks for me. So the internet was just starting to boom right and so there was only three other i didn't realize but there was only three other companies in england doing web design and that kind of work so you know you had the share of the market and wow as a, as a, as a child because i was a child as a child you have this naivety and fearlessness where you don't realize what you're doing is odd so i was like well this is kind of fun so i just rolled with it and we got bigger and bigger clients and you know the, the money was coming in and and it just kept rolling and you know and then it was it was really silly naive decisions like well i can't do all this i'm gonna have to find people so i used to go onto forums on the internet and say oh i need people who can do this if you know anyone let me know and i started to get employees and you know i spoke to an accountant i said i don't know how to do this can you help me and they were helping with structuring so I, I don't want to ascribe any level of, you know, I, I get really annoyed sometimes that entrepreneurs are sometimes put on a pedestal as these geniuses when oftentimes it's literally just curiosity and naivety, right? And so by the time I was 16, we had this sprawling business. It was really remarkable. And it was kind of fun because so Monday morning we have this thing. I'm, I'm sure you have it in Canada where, you know, when they have assembly in the morning, all the kids sit down and the teacher's sort of calling your name out and they desperately can't pronounce mine. So I'm Vicas, Vicas, whatever. <laughs> and um, then they're like, you know, so what did you do at the weekend? And somebody is like, oh, you know, I played football or I did this. And I'm sat there going, I flew back first class from New York because I was <laughs> at my office. Well, I can't say that because they won't believe me. And it was it was kind of fun. And in a way, I got really bullied at school because I was pretty big i wasn't very popular i wasn't very academic 
And this was almost like my biggest FU to the bullies was, well, right. screw you, right? Anyway, so the first dot-com bubble, when that burst, um, I basically had to sell parts of the business as fast as I could to pay for the bits that I couldn't sell. And um, I was almost back to square one. And then I had a chance conversation with my dad who traded fabrics. And he, go, and I said, he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. And he goes, well, whatever you do, don't get involved in textiles. And so I thought, this is kind of interesting. So I bought his business off him so he could retire. <laughs> and I started building a textiles business. And since then, you know, I invest in various startups. But it was, it, was, it was never the plan. My plan was to become an airline pilot, fly around the world, just watch planes, sit in planes, you have things to do with planes. That was the plan. But that's not how life worked out incredible so why did you not i mean is it the serendipity of life that you had all these other opportunities that drew you away from pursuing your goal of being a commercial airline pilot why wasn't that goal ever instantiated because in my in my naive little brain at, at that age as a child time time wasn't as finite as it is when we're a bit older so in my naive little mind, I can do it later. Yeah I, yeah, I was like, I'll get to it. Yeah. And then before you know it, you know, you're in your 20s and your career has changed. And, and also there was this and I, and I never knew why, but I'd always been someone who follows the thread. And, you know, I'll try things and experiment and play and tinker and I'll discover things that I didn't expect to be good at. And and that was kind of where business came in. I didn't ever expect I'd be good at it because I was never interested in it. You know, I, I, I never cared about business. And then it just sort of happened as this, this, this new career journey. And that still happens now. You know, thought economics was never a plan. I never planned to do all these interviews. You know, I never planned to teach at universities. You know, God knows if you asked my teachers back then, they would have assumed I would never do something like that. But if we don't allow ourselves to experience the opportunities that life gives us, then how do we ever know what we're capable of? Wow, that's fantastic. I mean, it, to me, you epitomize the play mindset because as you're describing each of those stories, whether it be how you created thought economics or how you created this uh, web design thing, it, it, it comes from this kind of curious, novelty-seeking, yeah. playful mindset. And play is not just to play with Lego. It's really a way of how you interact with the world, right? You and I right now are engaging in a form of intellectual yeah. play through the conversations that we're having, right? Yeah, yeah. and I think it's important to caveat that, you know, na navel-gazing is easy when you've made it. So there's a, you know, so I think it's really important to acknowledge the fact that, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be at a stage in life where I can play and I can indulge my interests and I can experiment. And there was a part, there was, there was definitely stages of my life where the absolute focus was just on, I need to, you know, pay the bills and make money and whatever. And, but even then, even in that stage of your life, you can't deny yourself the opportunity to matter yeah. because there was a conversation that I had when I was young with a friend who, who she, she got hit by, a, um, you know, we, we were still kids and when she got hit by a car crossing the road on the way to school. And, and I remember having a conversation with her the day before that happened, you know, we, and you know, kids have deep conversations. It's remarkable. Yeah. And saying, so what's it all about then? What's this life thing all about? And I remember she said to me, well, as long as it mattered to someone that you were here, then that's good. Right. Wow. And, and, but, but mattering that, that, that concept of mattering, is really important. It's really deep. It's really meaningful. What does it mean to have existed? What have I been able to make tidier in this room in this short time that I have been granted here? And so that means we we are obliged to make an impact, however we can, however small that is. You know, uh, oftentimes I'm going through a rough day. Most recently, uh, not to talk about this ad nauseum, because some of my uh, supporters might not want to meet, hear want to hear me say this again. I recently was hit with just the greatest existential theft in the history of the world through the taxes that were levied against me for yeah. for the for the parasitic mind and so on. And I felt really truly, uh, you know, raped. I couldn't believe that uh, that that 
such a taxation system could exist whereby some random person somewhere could just steal all of your life's work uh, under the guise of some socialist utopia. But in any case, I was really, really down. And I'm, I'm someone who's never down. I'm, in, I'm just by temperament so gregarious and effusive and, and happy. And I was really down. And then I would go into my emails. I'm, this is going to speak to the point of, of the mattering that you're talking about. And then I would look at some of the emails that I was receiving from people who were just uh, thankful for having read the book or for having listened to my show and it meant and suddenly it was an immediate happiness pill right so i was down on myself and this sucks they stole all my money and life is horrible and i i can't get out of this darkness and then suddenly a few emails where someone says you know what you know what I love you. I love what you're doing. Thank you so much. You've helped me. And immediately I had taken the happy pill because I matter to someone. And and that's a profoundly important thing we have to reflect on because that doesn't often come from family because there's a degree, so there's a degree of obligation there. There's a degree of obligation that if I gave birth to you or if we're family, then we ought to matter to each other. So that goes without saying. But for you to matter to a complete stranger yes. who has no obligation to know you, if you matter to that complete stranger, that's profound. Indeed. And that, that, that's leaving a legacy. And, you know, I, I remember doing um, an, uh, one of these you know, business panel events and, and somebody said, you know, it's quite easy to make a legacy when you've got the money to it. And I said, well, no, because anything you do that impacts someone else's life positively leaves a legacy. And you could do a million small actions or one giant action, but you're still going to make an impact. Right. And the more we do that every day, the more our worldview changes and the more you realize that what you thought was important isn't. Indeed. And that's that's a key learning that I've, I've had to take in life. Now, as I'm listening to you speak for the past 40 plus minutes, you, you strike me as a very happy and effusive and ebullient. I know. No. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going to I'm setting it up. <laughs> Now, earlier you mentioned that you had, uh, you know, 15 plus years of, of bouts of anxiety and depression. Yeah. So it's very hard for the person who's just watching you to reconcile what they're seeing now, a smile and open disposition. And with that reality, can you walk yeah. us through it, how you went from that, what happened then, how you're where you are now? So I think the first thing to observe is I remember the first time I spoke openly about my own mental health journey, hashtag, um, I got messages from people saying, oh, you know, I didn't expect exactly what you said. I right. didn't expect you to say that. And I, and, I, and I often replied to those messages saying, well, think about it. Imagine if I'd have said I have cancer and you would not email me and say, you didn't look very cancery. <laughs> I'm pretty surprised. So there's an equity of consideration right. we have to get through. But I, I was always quite I always thought I was just a bit hyperactive and a bit, you know, intense. And I'm really grateful for that because, you know, the 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 the, the counterweight to having a creative mind is you have a creative mind. And that creative mind goes off on its own little tangents and ruminates and thinks about things and that causes you emotional distress. And I always just dealt with it, you know, I, I did all the usual hippie things and went on courses and blah 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 blah. And um and it got worse and worse and worse. And I remember at the time when that first business was really suffering, it got to the point where I, I was finding it really hard to cope. And, and it was almost all consuming. So, you know, from the first moment you wake up after that split second where you don't quite know you're awake and everything's groovy. And then all of a sudden it's like whew, the reality kicks in. And there was one year where, you know, sadly, there was four suicide attempts. One of them came very, very close. And... You know, that was the moment where I was like, I realized that what I hadn't done is taken accountability for myself and taken responsibility for myself. And I had to grow up. What was, to... before you go on, forgive me for interrupting, and I, I hope it's not too personal to ask you, what was the genesis of your angst, whether it was your anxiety, your depression, yeah. or your eventual attempts at suicide? Is there a particular set of issues? What yeah. what caused you so, that? So there's a few. I think I think one of them was cultural. Um, so, so my background is is South Asian Indian, um, and in that world, face your you know your th th what you show to the world is is very important. And so it's kind of ingrained in you from when you were a child that if you're not successful, 
you know, what are people going to think? And if you're not X, Y, Z, what are people going to think? And so at the point at which you think you're going to fail, it becomes existential. You know, all of a sudden it's not, the reality is, oh, my business might not survive. It, it happens. I'll have to move on and it will be crap, but I'll get through it. This was a existential attack on my personhood that was happening and all of a sudden i didn't have a reason to exist anymore. you're going to bring shame to the family through your yes. failure might as well end yeah. it and the other side of it was after being bullied so much as a kid and being told i was a failure and all this kind of stuff there's this internalized part of me which still felt like that little kid who didn't ever think they were going to succeed and there was almost this notion of well what's the point and i i realized through the growing up process afterwards that I'd never really figured out what my value set was. I never figured out who I was when I wasn't at work. There was this observation that I'd made where imagine if we all went to a dinner party and we didn't know anybody and I put my hand out across the table and I shook your hand and I said, so tell me about you. Like, I, I, I feel like I know you well enough where you'd, you'd probably say something funny and charming and we'd have a conversation. But so many people would say, I'm a lawyer or I'm a banker. And the first thing they'll say is, this is what I do. Right. And it got me thinking, like, how sad is that when what we do is so intrinsic, therefore, to who we are? Right. Like, like how, how can that be compatible with, with being human? Because what I do is what I do. It's not who I am. Sure. Wow. And so, so when you thought... Uh, given your cultural background where it's important to be a doctor or this or yeah. that and and it looks like my business is going to fail my f i'm going to bring shame to the, my family uh, but were you able to go to your family and talk to them about this and they got you out of it or was it through no. another trajectory of healing no i i i called you know there's a helpline in the uk called the samaritans it's one of those anonymous call yeah. lines and i called them and I was able to talk to a stranger and the, the, there's a certain power in being able to say really dark things and making them real. So they're no longer these demons in your head. They're things that you can fight with in real life. And so, for example, the taboo around the word suicide, the taboo around I feel like this, I want to do this. You know, the minute you discuss it, that taboo is shattered and you're able to have a conversation. And you know, I was then able to go to a doctor, which I should have done a long time before, get support with the right medication, the right therapy and start to rebuild. And it took a long time. It was hard work, you know, but I'm glad that I went on that journey and learnt resilience tools because that was I, I wish I'd have learnt them when I was a kid. Wow. Uh, how much of, I mean, not to ask you to give a specific percentage, but roughly speaking, how much of the pharmacological intervention versus the talk therapy contributed to your eventual healing? I, I, I would really put them on a balanced pedestal. Um, I was very, very, very anti-medication. And, and it was only because I had a very good relationship with my therapist. He basically just, you know, cut me a deal to just give it a try. And it was remarkable because I had all these, you know, all these taboos in my head where they'll change you and they do this and they do that. But all that happened was it was like somebody took the volume dial and went. And, wow. and all of a sudden it meant that I could engage with the therapy process better because I wasn't up here. I was in a, in a much more even keel to be able to talk through, you know, really troubling things and really connect the dots again. Um, and so. It was very important for me. And, you know, I, I, I'm obviously not a professional. I can't say it's for everyone. But for me, it was essential. And I, I genuinely think they were as important, if not more so, than the than the talking therapy aspects. Um, and also, frankly, much cheaper than um, the grifters who try and sell you coaching and so forth. Yeah, right. Uh, I remember one time, I, I, I don't think given what we're talking about, you'll mind that I shared this. And we were we had had a lovely interaction. I can't remember the details. And then you wrote me, you know, thank you so much. And this was the first time actually that you had mentioned that you had had some mental health issues where you said, you know, this interaction or your kind words really meant a lot to me today because I was going through this really bad bout of anxiety this morning or something. And what had struck me first, it had kind of broken my heart that you were experiencing that, but there was a humility to you sharing 
that episode yeah. that you had just had. So I think it, it it speaks to the fact that when you're humble enough to say, you know what, we all struggle and I struggle yeah. and here I am. Uh, that's already half the battle won. If, if you're so stoic in the, not in the ancient Greek sense of the term, but in the common vernacular, I'm stoic, I never... Fi-. And if you, you're not willing to say, hey, we all suffer once in a while, yeah. that probably delays your healing. But also it speaks to the biggest problem, I think, in entrepreneurship culture right now, which is this kind of people put on this face of who they think they ought to be. And so, you know, most people think, oh, I've got to be strong and tough and all this when I walk into a meeting. But guess what? For example, if we were meeting in real life today, and let's say if your back was hurting, you would almost certainly say, oh, you know, do excuse me, my back's a bit bit achy today. And so if you wiggle about, I'm like, okay, that's why. And I, I always feel like, you know, if I'm having you know a bad brain day, let's say, it makes much more sense for me to say, look, I'm, I'm having a bit of a you know anxious day today, so you know just bear that in mind, and just dismiss it because yeah. it is what it is. And and the thing that I I, I really you know the re- the only reason that I I talk about it more now is because I really worry that we have a generation of business people who watch so much kind of hustle culture and all this on YouTube and TikTok and everything that they end up becoming clones of themselves. So when I go to business events, everyone acts the same. Everyone basically dresses the same. Everyone speaks the same and, you know, gets up at 4 a.m. to write in their gratitude journal and all this. And I'm like, well, that's fine. But come on, like, this isn't real. This isn't real life. I think that uh, to de- to show your weaknesses is, I mean, it's going to sound cliche but it's a, it's a sign of strength, right? So I'll give you a, a, a much smaller story than anything that you know, you've experienced. You, you seem to have experienced these things for much longer. About three, four years ago, well, actually a bit more, maybe in 2017, when I was receiving a lot of death threats for all sorts of positions I was taking, I started developing these symptoms that mm-hmm. subsequently struck, I mean, it seemed that they were kind of anxiety symptoms because I really was, even though cognitively i wasn't feeling any anxiety but in the back of my mind you know not knowing when they were going to come and decapitate me was i guess weighing heavily on me and that would kind of wax and wane those symptoms uh and one day uh last summer in july of last summer i I discussed this for the first time publicly on uh, joe rogan's uh show the last time i was on uh I, we were driving, my family and I, our kids, my wife and I, we were going to get some Peruvian chicken as we often do because it's nice keto and it's it made yeah. me lose a lot of weight uh, just like you went on a weight loss journey. Yeah. And uh, I started getting these incredible symptoms as though I'm about to have a heart attack yeah. or maybe I'm having... And so they rushed me, they meaning my, my wife, we went to the emergency room and then they said, well, you know, you, you had a panic attack. Now, there was nothing that had happened. There was nothing ruminating in my head that was worrying me that could have predicted that I was about to have this panic attack. It came out of nowhere. It was one of those 100-foot waves that, you know, rogue waves that hits you. I haven't had one since. But then I thought to myself, I said, you know, should I talk about this publicly or not? And then I thought, you know what? A strong person, a honey badger, would not equivocate about talking about this because if I talk about it, given my platform, and it helps other, isn't that ultimately a measure of strength rather than always putting the bravado of being macho? And guess what? A lot of people wrote to me and said, my God, hearing that story helped me so much. But also, if you... If you talk about the aspects of yourself that you would perceive as weaknesses, no one can use them against you. So no, true. nobody can turn around to me and say, Vikas, if you don't do this, I'll tell people about you know your depression. Screw it, they know. <laughs> it's part of my life, and and that to me is really important because you know being strong in life is not about you know just being physically big. It's about knowing that whatever is blowing at you, you can face into it and you can take it and you can move on. And and this is, you know, resilience, I think, is the single most important skill that we need to teach people because life is really hard. Yeah. Everything is really hard. And if we think we've got it hard, try and go to where you came from, where, where we're working with in place of war. And you will see people who are going through the most unbelievable circumstances. You face into it with dignity, with humility, and they fight, right? Yeah. And that shows the type of strength they have. And frankly, if I may, 
I think the reason that you are able to deal with, you know, the, the torrent of abuse that you often get online and so on is because of your early experiences sure. and, you, and you being able to contextualize. Absolutely. What, uh, what what really matters absolutely and i mean again i'm, I'm loving this conversation because in, in one of the chapters in my forthcoming book it's all about persistence resilience and anti-fragility yeah. so and right nasim talib a fellow lebanese author as you know wrote a book on anti-fragility and so what you're describing there is exactly that which is stressors as long as they don't break us truly are uh, part of us engaging in optimal functioning, right? If if we never experience any of these stressors, then it won't work. Uh, Seneca, by the way, I have a, a I have an epigraph in that chapter on resilience and anti fragility. So the great Seneca from several thousand years ago has this amazing quote talking about how the most resilient trees are those that have evolved to handle with you know to sway with the wind, and which which I thought was amazing because. You know, here we are, you know, we're, 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 we're louding ourselves for all of these brilliant insights. And yet, guys, 2,500 years ago had already beaten <laughs> us to those insights, yeah. uh, which, which speaks to actually another point that Nassim had made once to me, uh, maybe in a jocular way. But he said, you know, Gad, I don't know what it is that you study in psychology because everything that there is to know about human nature, the ancient Greeks have already discovered it. And, you know, he was almost right because yeah. these guys, I mean, were just absolutely brilliant and profound. But, you know, it's funny, isn't it? Because there's, there's two ways of reading that statement. The statement of the Greeks had already discovered it could either be treated with humility, i.e., well, we're not that complicated. There's not that much to right. know. Or it could be treated with ego, which is, well, what did they know? Maybe they missed something. And I think the former is true yeah. because, you know, we we are we are extraordinarily internally complex beings that are also paradoxically extraordinarily simple. And when we understand those basic impulses that drive us, and that's part of the therapy process, really, for me, yeah. when we understand those basic impulses, all of a sudden we can drive ourselves better. And, and that's a profound learning. And, and you know, if, and, and again, I'm not just saying it because, because we're here, but, you know, this is what I took from, you know, the parasitic mind was it helped me to understand the human bases of many of the things that I'm seeing in the world. And it's almost like this light bulb. I mean, obviously people can also, you know, read about some of those views in, <laughs> in, in this wonderful book. Yeah, that's um, but, but nevertheless, this is critical. This is why I encourage, I mean, a funny story is when, when I teach on MBA programs, I, I, I scare the MBA students on the first lesson because I tell them that I'm going to urge them to meditate because I think it's kind of important. But also, I don't want you to read business books. And they're like, yeah. why can I not read business books? Um, because to me, I'm like, I want you to read the classics. I want yeah. you to read history. I want you to read music. I want you to read about art. I want you to read about anything that you might not read about because you can only connect the number of dots that you put in your mind. Boy, it's... It seems as though you've you've already read the book that I've yet to release because I have a whole section on intellectual variety seeking. So all of the things that you've listed, read in art and in history and in politics and in music, yeah. is precisely the point that I'm making there. Don't be a stay in your lane person. Uh, some of the greatest insights that have come out of in science have come at the intersection of interdisciplinary uh, interdisciplinary research, right? And so this is one of the things that I. Uh, you know, I'm critical of, of in the universities from this side of their mouth. They say that they they'd like to support interdisciplinarity. Mm -hmm. But once you come to them with an interdisciplinary program, everybody becomes super territorial about their disciplinary silos. And yeah. so breaking through these silos is fundamental to our growth. But it's moral hazard, isn't it? Yeah. The minute the minute money's involved, you create moral hazard. And, you know, if we think to, if we think back to Renaissance Italy, um, you know, you had the patrons of the arts and the patrons of, uh, of academia and the patronage meant that I could give you money to just go and be clever. Exactly. And, and, and the point is, I just want to hear what you discover and be around you and soak that up. What I'm not saying is I'm giving you money to research this specific thing and create this specific report. Because exactly. That is, is the same in my world, in the corporate world. You know, the CEO who is incentivized to quarterly earnings reports is not going to take long term world changing decisions because right. their paycheck won't comply with that. So, you know, one of the reasons I made that gift 
of thought economics is I want to encourage more intellectual philanthropy. I want to encourage a new movement of patronage of intellectual pursuits in a way where there's no specific requirement for them other than to explore and be clever. Fantastic. Last question, then we'll say goodbye and then we'll uh, offline. Oh, uh, I al although I know it's almost it's an hour. So I just want to be respectful of your time, just like you've always been respectful of mine. Although in Arabic, there is an expression which I'm going to say it first in Arabic and then I'm going to translate it. In Arabic, when you're leaving someone, when you don't want to leave them, you say, which means it is impossible to be satiated of you, yeah. which is a very polite way of saying that even if we're saying goodbye, it is not a measure of my losing interest. It's only a measure of the... See, Arabic is a very poetic language. Oh, you uh, say that, Gad, but in, in meeting situations, when I need to exit a meeting... I, I use the phrase that you use, which is that I'm being very conscious of your time. And that usually <laughs> means, bye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So last question. Uh, what gives you, so you've had many, many different journeys. You've been an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, you're an investor. You've got this incredible platform with thought economics, all different types of, mm -hmm. you dabble all over the place. If I were to ask you, uh, what gives you purpose and meaning in life? Take it away, sir. I don't know. And I don't care that I don't know, because I don't think I'm going to discover that until the day that my last breath comes. Because that that's the only moment I will ever have to answer that question. So it, so is that does that come from the fact that many of these journeys that you've you've gone through have come through the magic of serendipity? Therefore, you don't like to take a top down perspective in answering this question, but rather you leave it up to the ephemeral nature of of life to kind of guide you through the different so, exciting paths. To the extent that like and, and again, I, I say this, but without it, I, it may sound crass, but it's not intended to. And I, I've already had so many experiences in life, which I think I could probably fill many lifetimes in my life so far, and I'm extremely grateful for that. But, and this is the important but, I don't know what's coming next. And I think until that last, until the credits start rolling on my own life, I won't know what the story was. And I know that sounds awfully spiritual and mystical, but it's, and it's not meant to, it's just, I don't know, you know, I might come up with a startup idea that makes billions of dollars and I can give the billions of dollars away and that might be even more of an impact. Or, you know, I might be crossing the road and somebody has a heart attack and I save their life. But who knows what opportunities you have to do some good in life? If you and, go ahead, go ahead, finish your and, point. And so for me, you know, let's hope it's many, many years in the future. But when when that final moment comes in my life, that's when I will know the answer to your question. Amazing. Wonderful. Uh, Vikas, unbelievable conversation. Let's do this again. Uh, at least let me create a tie between us. Right now, it's two to one. You've invited me twice, and I've only invited you once. I'd like Manchester United and Manchester City to walk away with a tie, two to two. Well, my, my promise to you is there is a there's a hotel next to the United ground. Now, bear with me, because this conversation might not go where you think it does. So I will take you to this hotel, Dr. Sad, and some of the rooms near the top have a view over the ground. Oh! Right? So imagine if we recorded an episode of The Sad Truth. I'm in. With Unite, with action. I don't want to hear anymore. Back. I'm in. Just make it happen, and I'm there. Uh, by the way, is am I wrong to say uh, that you're a Manchester United fan? Yeah, I, I had no choice. I, I inherited that from my dad. Mm, so, so, so you are not a perfect human being as I otherwise <laughs> thought you were. Because who can watch Manchester, Manchester City play with Kevin De Bruyne and not switch allegiances? I don't understand it, but hey, that's part of well, human irrationality. We'll have to cover that over some tea. We will. Uh, thank you so much. Stay on the line so we can say goodbye offline. It was such a delight to speak to you. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Cheers.